Well, I'm excited to be up here. I've been uh, crazy all day long. I had to come in early just to, I couldn't sit around the house anymore. I was so excited I couldn't stand it. And so uh, I'm, I'm anxious to get into God's Word. Before we, before we do that, I want to, uh, everyone's been so gracious and kind to, to Meredith and I. I know you've asked about our time uh, away, and uh, I certainly appreciate uh, you asking. And I just want to let you know that we had a great time. And uh, we went up to, to Augusta, Georgia, and, and visited Blair and Maddie and, and before he gets deployed. And uh, we went up to uh, Greenville, South Carolina, and visited some family and just had some, some much-needed rest and got rejuvenated again. And I was anxious to get back here and get back to the work, you know. And so we had a great time. And so I, I appreciate you guys. And, and, and really, thanks to the generosity and the kindness of, of many of you here in the church, we were able to go. Uh, as you, a lot of you know, we were not going to be able to go, and, uh, but you guys were kind and gracious and you helped us go, and you guys know what I'm talking about, so we just want to thank you for that very, very much. Um, I wish Meredith could be up here to, to thank you as well, but on her behalf, I, I want to say thank you. Um, you see up there in the picture, when I was, when I was up here last time, I, I told you that I had a very small bucket list, Remember? And it was to go to, to, the, to, to the Masters turn. To go to, not to go to the Masters necessarily, but to go to Augusta National and walk the, the, uh, the fairways of green. And uh, I really, 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 really want to go. So if you guys want to buy me a ticket, it's totally cool. Like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm unashamed. Like, just grovel, whatever you want me to do. Um, but that's my only thing on my bucket list is to walk those, those fairways. I don't care if they're playing. I actually, I'd rather not even have them playing. I just want to walk out there by myself because then I could just cry the whole time and get away with it and nobody would see me. I wouldn't be embarrassed. It'd be awesome. Uh, but I didn't get to go, but I was up in Augusta, I was up in Augusta this, this past week. So that's, look how close I got. I mean, I was right across the street. So like, I, I just want to thank you, like, because of you guys, because you're generous and kind, I got very, very close. I got closer to my bucket list being completed than I ever have been. It's like I was right there, right there. And, and soon as Blair and I walked over there, a sheriff's car pulled right out, like he was right there. I wasn't even, I was on the other side of the road. And, but he, right, right there, we ain't getting in, but uh, man, we had, a, we had a great time. So thank you. Thank you very, very much for your kindness to my family. Um, anyway, um, one of the things that I, uh, that I had done before uh, I left on vacation is I kind of, I don't know if you noticed some of the, the prints on the wall in the back uh, hallway here of past message series that we've had in our church over the years. And they've been, it's been a great time and a joy to, to preach all those things. And I've been going now for about eight years and super, super excited about that. Uh, but every message series had uh, a different title and a different, uh, different content, different subjects. Uh, we, we studied um, the, this thing called uh, Transformed, and it was a study of, of Peter, you know, and Peter was a cowardly man, right? But then all of a sudden, when he gets filled with the Holy Spirit, he's not very, bold, he's not very cowardly anymore. Now he's bold, so we see the transformation in his life, and so we can see what our life should look like when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, when we get saved. So we did that. We recently studied this series called I Am, So I Am. It was the idea of this is who God is, so this is who we should be, right? That was a, a great series for me. Uh, we did a series called I Am Jonah. You know, Jonah was a stubborn man, and God told him what to do. And, and I know none of you have done this, but he didn't, he didn't want to do what God told him to do. And so it didn't go very well for him. We studied that, and that was a great series, too. I studied, one of my favorite series that I got to preach was a series called Church 316. Have you ever done a study of the 316s of the Bible? They're powerful. These, most people just think that there's, you know, John 316, for God so loved the world, you know. But all the 316s are powerhouses. Hi. I didn't see you all sitting right there. It's good to see you. <laughs> <coughs> they were a great message series, and they were very beneficial. But, you know, for the last year and a half... We've been doing something that's a little bit more focused. Instead of learning about how these different people lived and how we should live, which is awesome and we should live a certain way. Amen? amen. Okay, this is the amen section from, right, from Marie right on down to Ashley. This is the amen section. So if you're sitting up front, you didn't know this, you have to say amen. You get to get rowdy, okay? I don't have to ask you. I know you will. Okay. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so, so, so we've been studying... We've been studying very specifically, not just like 
features of the Christian life, we've been studying Christ himself. Because all those things don't matter unless you get this question answered. Who is Jesus? But that's the focal point of the church. You have to have this. Who is Jesus? Without that, right, nothing else means anything. The rest of it is meaningless. And without tonight's message, who Jesus is, is nothing. If next week is Easter, then this week, Jesus is on the cross. This is our Good Friday right here, right now. Now, I don't know about you. Some people think Christmas is the big thing. Some people think Easter's the big thing. I think this is the big thing. This is, my, this is the biggest day of the year right now. I'm excited. Because Jesus is going to the cross. That's the big thing to me. That's just my personal opinion. It doesn't have to be yours. You have the right to be wrong. <laughs> so my task tonight is to be a tour director. My task tonight is to take you to the cross of Jesus Christ so that you can understand what happened there. So you actually know what your yes is. And I'm unashamed by telling you this. I don't know every single person in this room, but I'm telling you without apology, I want you to say yes to Jesus tonight. That's what I want. That's why I'm here. That's why I studied. That's why I prayed. That's why I'm breathing. That's why I'm yelling. I want you to say yes to Jesus, and I want you to know what you're saying yes to. See, a lot of people think that they're saved, but they really have no idea what saved really means. And you got to know what this thing is. You got to know about the cross for sure. That's my task tonight. So I started studying for this specifically last week and, and Jay was gracious and you know he came and he stepped in so I could get away and I could really spend a lot of time alone with the Lord and get ready and we've been studying the Holy Spirit on Wednesdays. Holy Spirit's weird man. You start following the Holy Spirit you never know where he's going to take you right? You just never know. He's the wild goose. You just never know. And so I started studying. I started, I started praying and I started studying and, and it took me to some, some weird places. Let me ask you a question. Anyone in here binge watch Netflix? Raise your hand. I didn't know it was an epidemic. I had no idea that it was this bad. Do you realize that like 75% of the room just raised their hand? I binge watched comedians in cars getting coffee. Do you know what I'm talking about? Jerry Seinfeld. Why do they call it French toast? No, I'm just. You don't toast it. It's not from France. Anyway, so it's an awesome, awesome, awesome show. He gets, he gets in these collector cars, and he, and he describes the car, totally cool cars, and then he picks up some comedian, and they drive around, and then they go to a coffee house and just drink coffee and have fun. It's like, I think it's heaven, right? It's heaven. It's awesome. I watched like, like ser I'm not joking, I think I watched like nine episodes in one day. I couldn't go to sleep. We don't have TV at my house. I was like a junkie. Oh, this is so good. This is so good. It was awesome. We went up to see Blair, and that's all I did was stay up all night and watch the show. It was so cool. So I'm not the only binge watcher. Who binged on the Olympics? Raise your hand. Anyone binge on the Olympics? One, two. Two people. Maybe they put it on Netflix. You might watch. Right? The Olympics are big. This is where the Holy Spirit took me. I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm, I'm studying the scripture, and all of a sudden it's like the Olympics. The Olympics? What's this have to do with anything? What's this have to do with Jesus? Like I'm trying to study about the cross, and I'm going to take him to the cross and teach him about salvation, what all that means. The Olympics? Do you guys know what that thing is there on the screen? Nobody. Maybe if you had Justin Timberlake jumping around in there, singing and dancing, you'd understand what that is. Ah, that's the stadium that they built for the Olympics, for the opening ceremony, right? That thing holds 85,000 people. 
Listen to this. It cost a hundred mil, you gotta do this. A hundred million dollars. A hundred million dollars for one reason. So Justin Timberlake could run around and sing, and I thought he did a pretty good job. I watched that. We went over to Mimi's, I watched it. He was actually pretty good. He sang and danced and they prayed and the lights were flashing and all this cool stuff. That's what they built that thing for. And guess what? That's it. That's what it's for. A hundred million dollars for an opening ceremony. Do you know what's amazing about this thing is that the ceremony and the stadium, they have no power, they have no pull, they have no real weight other than physical, you know, there's just nothing, it's just, it, that's all it is, is it, it, if anything, it has the, the task and the ability to point to something greater that's coming. You see, they, they, th that huge thing was made for one purpose, to point to something else that was coming. What was coming is those singular events, those, one, those singular events, that's where life changes, not in the ceremony, not in the stadium. They of themselves are not the pinnacle, but they point to something awesome and it screams, something's coming, pay attention, listen up, here it comes. When the skier or the skater or the sledder or any other sport that starts with S, when they win, when they defeat their foe, that's the main event. That's the life change. That's the thing that the stadium and the ceremony are pointing to. That's the main event, not that itself. Make no mistake, I don't care what anyone tells you, the Olympics are about victory. They're not about celebration. They're about victory. Listen, those athletes are not training day and night and day and night so they could see Justin Timberlake up there dancing, having a good old time. That's not why they do that. That's not why they wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning every day for decades to see Justin singing and dancing in front of 85,000 people in a stadium that cost $100 million and it might never be used again. That's not what it's about. Not at all. It's funny, as I was studying and preparing and getting all this stuff, like about the stadium, I, I was reminded of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was kind of like the stadium. Do you know that Jesus called him? By the way, I just want to let you know, uh, I'm going long tonight, so you just, if you need to go to the bathroom, go now. <laughs> I didn't preach last week. You're in for it. <laughs> Do you know that Jesus, you know what Jesus said of John the Baptist? He's the best person that ever was. Imagine having that on your resume. Oh, look at me. I'm good looking. I'm smart. I'm wealthy, yeah? God said I'm the best person ever. Drop the mic, right? That's John the Baptist, the best dude ever created on this earth. But yet, the most awesome guy ever says, I'm just like, I'm dunking you in water just to show that you don't want to be an idiot anymore. You don't, want to, you don't want to be sinning. You don't want to be stupid and do this stupid stuff. So I'm dunking you in water to show that you've changed your way. But someday, someone else that's way greater than me, way greater than the greatest person that's ever lived, is going to come, and he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He's going to put God inside. I'm putting you in water. He's putting him inside of you. And he's so awesome. This is the greatest guy that's ever lived. He said, I, he is so awesome that I can't even get down and tie his shoes. I'm nothing. That's the stadium. I'm nothing. And it's a fresh reminder to me, too. I'm nothing. I am nothing. I am nothing but a big mouth. I'm a herald of someone else's glory, of someone else's story, of someone else's person. I'm nothing. I'm just an unworthy servant doing my duty, we all need that. None of us are that awesome. No one. So listen, when it comes to your life personally, your very existence, this, tonight, this that we'll discuss, this is your main event. 
This is your gold medal opportunity. Everything else is the opening ceremony. Every event, everything, every experience, every, every tear, every laugh, every loss, every gain, every single thing, all empty and powerless other than to point to this one thing. This one thing. And just as the athlete will train for weeks and months and years and sometimes decades for one race, we too, all of us, should be focused on this one thing or else everything else is meaningless. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the gold medal moment for all of us and no life truly changes without this victory. I'm preaching better than those amens. Mm. <clears throat> now listen, let's get something straight in the church. I don't know what goes on out there, and I don't know what goes on in any other church. But let's get something straight in this church. we got to get this down. Okay? This is super, super important. But this that we're going to talk about tonight, this is not the most important thing. It's not the most important thing. See, some people in the church will say the most important thing is the salvation issues. You hear that a lot. What's the, mo what's the majors? What's the most important thing? Well, the salvation things are the most important things. And I would say no, not even close. Psalm 90, verse 2. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. That's the most important thing. He's the most important. Before anything ever was, him. After everything else, him. Above all circumstance, time, it doesn't make any difference. He's the most important thing. And that's it. Yes. Clap. Yes, very good. He is the most important thing. He is the most important thing. But for you personally... This is the most important thing. Without this thing, there's no life. There's no purpose. There's no victory. And ultimately for you, there's no heaven if you don't get this one thing. <clears throat> so for you, this is the most important thing that you could ever listen to right now. Now, I did say uh, this one thing is the most important thing. That's singular, right? But... Uh, I also said at the same time that it's the death and resurrection of Jesus that's the most important thing. So it's like, okay, so is it singular or is it plural? Well, I would just say that it's both. Uh, see, I, I told you earlier that I think that the, the, the cross, when he goes to the cross, like that's the big thing. That's what I think. Anybody think that? Raise your hand. Yeah, yeah. How many thinks that Easter, the resurrection, is the biggest thing? Raise your hand. Okay, yeah, right? Yeah, I think that they're inseparable. I think they're two sides to the same coin. I, I don't think you can separate the two of them. I think they're supernaturally intertwined into one event that impacts every single person greater than any event ever in the history of the universe. And you can't say, listen, if there's no death the, and he just resurrects and you, and you get to, let's say you get to resurrect with him, but you ain't saved, what good is that? You want to spend forever in hell? That would suck, right? Who would want to do that? You got to get saved. And, but what if, what if he goes to the cross and he dies for your sin, but then he never resurrects? Because if he doesn't resurrect, guess who doesn't also resurrect? Point to yourself, right? You don't. And, and, and if he doesn't resurrect, then that means there's something stronger than him. And if there's something stronger than him, then Jesus ain't God. And I don't want to worship him if he ain't God, right? So they're just, you've got to have both of them. They're one event to me. That's just me. There's the Bible and this is me. I think they're one event. I think that they're one event. I don't think you can separate the two. And so this is the bullseye right here, right now, tonight. John 5, 39, Jesus says of himself, he says, you search the scriptures day and night because you believe that they contain eternal life. But all the while, they all point, all, all, some, someone say all. all, all point to me, he said. All of it points to me. There's nothing in there that you could do. It says, to, to, it tells us not to lie. Did you know that? That doesn't get you into heaven. It tells us not to cheat, steal. It tells us not to, 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 to commit adultery. It tells us not to kill. It tells us not to be selfish. 
Tells us to, wives, submit to your husband in all things as unto the Lord. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and lay your life down for her. All these different things that we should do, we should do. But except that those things don't work. They're great things. You should do those things, but they don't get it done. Jesus said, all that stuff just points to me. And so, let me take you to your opening ceremony. Let me take you to the opening ceremony. This is what we would call the meta-narrative of the Bible. This is the whole thing. This is the whole thing. This is everything. This is your opening ceremony. I'm going to summarize the entire Bible for you right here in like a minute. So God creates everything in the heavens and on earth, including, on day six, people. It's the Imago Dei. It's, it's God saying, let us make people in our image to be like me. That's what he says. Let, let them be like us. I want them to be like me, God said. So in all of creation, there's, there's only one thing that is actually like God. Like, its greatest, his greatest expression of his own reflection is you, me, us. His greatest creation. But in Genesis 3, shortly after Adam and Eve sin, and the universe is broken, and sin enters, and death enters into every single person who will ever live. However, God does not lose. Amen. Amen. Yeah. God does not lose. He made us in his image. So do you think there's any chance that his greatest creation that looks and acts like him is going to lose because then he loses and God doesn't lose so he starts the process of redemption Genesis 17 he chooses Abraham ultimately Israel as his people to begin the redemption of the human race because he wants his right and perfect relationship restored back with his greatest creation and so you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses, you know, the Red Sea and the burning bush and the ten plagues and the exodus from Egypt and, and the Ten Commandments, the law is given. You all know about that. Moses never gets to go into the promised land, but Joshua takes over. He leads him into the promised land. And then there's King Saul and, and, and King David. You remember King David, David and Goliath? You guys remember that story, right? He, he whoops Goliath, the representation of evil and darkness. And then there's David. He represents God, right? That's, he's, he says, God's on my side, right? So we got God and David against Goliath and Satan. And guess who wins? Because God doesn't lose, right? That's a win. That's a win in the win column for the Lord. And so uh, after David, there's uh, his son Solomon, the, the, the smartest, wealthiest person that's ever lived, supposedly. And then, of course, there's Elijah, the great prophet, the story of Mount Carmel, and, and it's God, and, and Elijah the prophet, and then there's, there's Baal, this fake God with his false prophets, and there's that big contest up on the mountain, and whoever's God is real is going to send down heaven, uh, fire from heaven, and they pray, and oh, Baal, answer us, oh, Baal, answer us, and nothing happens, and, and Elijah says, hey, God, fire, wham! He win, another win for the Lord, faithful to his task. Faithful, faithful. And then Elijah's student, Elisha, and then Nehemiah rebuilds Jerusalem. Queen Esther saves the entire Jewish population from this evil man, Haman, who's planning on killing every single Jewish person. God, again, faithful to his people, faithful to his mission. That's another win right there. And uh, then there's Job. Of course, his life better the second half than it was the first. Another win for the Lord and his people. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezra, Ezekiel, Daniel. Daniel in the lion's den, remember that one? Right, another win for the Lord. Another win for the Lord. Evil thinks he's gonna, they're going to take out Daniel. No, God says, no, not my guy. Not my guy. My story will continue. I will redeem. And it's another win. And then uh, how about the prophet Hosea? If you guys don't know that story, how about this one? You think you got a tough... God said, hey, I want you to represent your unfaithfulness, you people, you unfaithful people. I want to show how I love you, even though you're unfaithful. So he says to the prophet, Hosea, I want you to go marry this woman, Gomer, who's a prostitute. She's going to cheat on you with all these men, and you're going to stay faithful to her. Just to show everyone else exactly what I am to you. 
another massive win for the Lord. Joel, Zechariah, then of course the Virgin Mary and Joseph and, and, and the Virgin, you know, you're going to get pregnant by the Holy Spirit and the angels are coming and, and you're going to have this child and it's going to be Jesus and then they go to Bethlehem and Jesus is born. John the Baptist announces, Judas betrays, the Jews blame, Pilate caves and then he sentences the innocent Jesus to die on the cross. And here's the bullseye right here, right here. John 19.30, Jesus is on the cross. And he utters the three most powerful, famous words that have ever been spoken in the history of the universe. He said, it is finished. <clears throat> what does that all mean? See, to different people, that can mean different things. And it's kind of weird. You got to think about this. You know, the disciples, they're all fired up about Jesus. He's going around city to city, performing miracles. They're like, hey, follow me. And, and they, they leave their fishing nets and their boats and their family and every bit of provision. They go follow this guy. And, and he's like a rock star now. He's going from city to city. He's like the Rolling Stones. And, and he's, he's popular and everyone's crowded around him. And it's going great. And all of a sudden, he's dead. You're reading the, after Jesus leaves, you know, Peter and the guys, they just went back, so, oh, well, I guess that's it. They just went back to fishing. I think they're from Lake County. <laughs> I'm just kidding, kind of. But, so the disciples, right, so when Jesus says it's finished, maybe they're like, well, that was a good run. I'm not them, I don't know. To the Jews who wanted him dead, they're psyched. He's, it's finished. You're dang right it is. We won. To the Romans who didn't want any trouble, they don't want anybody who's, who's going to rebel or start a revolution. <laughs> they don't want that. So maybe to them, hey, it's finished. I like that. Pilate was probably pretty excited about all that. And Satan himself, he thinks, hey, this Jesus fad has come to its end. Awesome. Could that be what, it's, what it means? I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't think that's what it means, but when you're there in the moment and all this stuff has happened in, this, in and around Jerusalem and Galilee and all of a sudden the guy's dead and he says it's finished. Everybody wants closure, right? That's what you hear all the time. I need closure. I need closure. How about this? I'm dead. It's finished. That's closure. So to some that might be what's happening. Maybe it's just done. Well, I didn't learn what I'm about to say in seminary, but let me share it with you, and I think it's very, very true. Proclamation without explanation leads to constipation. <laughs> and if you don't know what I mean, if, constipation means you keep putting it in, but it doesn't go anywhere. And the Pharisees were constipated. They had all this stuff going in, but it never did anything, right? And, and we don't need to be that. So we need to understand. I, you don't need to go into a church and have some dude get up there and say, hey, this is what it says. This is what it says. Let's pray. If you don't get something from this today, then it's a tremendous waste of time. So we need to understand what it means when Jesus said it is finished. What does that mean to you and me? Okay, so I have five things that I jotted down. I hope that you'll jot them down as well and you'll reflect on them often. Did you like that one, constipation? I'd ask my wife if I could say that before we did this. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand why they teach that over there at First Baptist. Um, just kidding. So here's the first thing. When Jesus said it's finished, the thing that was finished was the story. The story's finished. Like, the story is not finished in a sense that, like, even right now, as you hear the Word of God proclaimed to you, like, the Holy Spirit's using the Word of God to transform you so you can be more like Jesus and more prepared for glory. Like, that's awesome. However, the story of redemption, the task that made redemption possible has been accomplished on the cross. 
I just summarized the entire meta narrative of the Bible. Like, this is the beginning. And then all of a sudden, here's Jesus saying, it's finished. So, but somewhere in there, there's, there's prophecies that kind of let us in and, and shed light on the actual story of redemption. I want to take you to a couple different spots. I want to take you to um, Isaiah chapter 9. I mentioned Isaiah in the meta narrative. Isaiah was one of the most powerful prophets uh, for the Lord. And in Isaiah chapter 9, it says this in verse 6, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. And I love this. The passionate... Listen, this is not King James. So just so you know, this is the NLT. So what the, the writers here are trying to do is give you a clear understanding of the, of the original text. Look what it says. This is what's going to happen. And it says, The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. That's awesome. Passionate commitment to his people and to his mission to redeem us. And, and he is passionately committed to this thing called the church, right? He is passionately committed. That means he's given everything. You know what he's doing right now? Building his church. Amen. You know what he did before you, 6 o'clock came? He was building his church by inspiring you to come. Amen. You didn't do that. It worked. It worked. It worked. He always wins. He, he's always at work. This is, he's passionately committed to the church. And we're supposed to be Christ-like. What he's looking for is people that are passionately committed to building his church. Partners with him to build the church. He's, he is passionately committed to this thing. He's not, he doesn't work part-time. So we see a story beginning to unfold describing a Savior here that's going to be born to us. And then we see later on in Isaiah chapter 53, very famous section of Scripture. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the whole chapter to you right now. I'm going to do enough of that in church. Reading the Scriptures. Someone called me the other day who used to come here. They're living out of state now. He says, can you help me with something? I've been going to this church now for a couple months, and I don't even see Bibles in their pews. Yeah. Run! <laughs> Run. Like, you don't need to come up here and, and uh, like, I don't even like telling you about my little trip to Augusta. Because that's not going to help you any. Is it? If I got in and got to walk along, and caddy for Phil Mickelson, would it help you in any way? No. Not one bit. It would help me. I just want to say that. <clears throat> it wouldn't help you at all. You don't need to hear about that. You need to hear the Word of God. Right? That's what we need. That's what the church needs. So I'm going to do something that's like abnormal. I'm going to read a whole, section, a whole, read a whole chapter of the Bible right now. Isaiah 53. This is, I don't know, you just, my Jewish mom who I love, I read this, she reads this. I'm like, yeah, who are they talking about? I don't want to talk about it. You tell me. So Isaiah 53 Talk about the story of redemption. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Hmm. Okay, I don't know. My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows. We're going to sing that in a little while. Acquainted with deepest grief, we turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God. A punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path, paths to follow our own. 
yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a, a lamb to the slaughter. As a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream. But he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. Amen. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels. He bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. That's the word of the Lord. And of course, we know this is flawlessly describing Jesus Christ. Amen. Which is why John the Baptist can, can, like loud and proud, point to this Jesus who's coming across the horizon and say, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He knew who this was. But this story doesn't originate like with Isaiah. Like Isaiah didn't make this thing up. It didn't originate during his life or during his ministry. No, 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 no. Even though that was about 800 years before the birth of Jesus, that's not when this story begins. Speaking of this lamb that would take away the sin of the world, John the Apostle tells us at the end of the Bible in Revelation 13 verse 8, he refers to, to Jesus this way, the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. See, we all know that there was a day on the cross 2,000 years ago at Calvary where Jesus Christ went to the cross and paid for your sin. He died on that cross. He said it's finished on that day. Do you remember this? But yet, the story didn't really start there. The story of the lamb being slain was not that day at Calvary. It happened that day, but it was God's plan. It already happened. Like a creation. <laughs> way, way, like at the beginning from the foundations of the earth. That's when this story of redemption was planned. The prophesied Messiah, the Savior, the anointed one has come to redeem. And God's full redemptive plan initiated and now on the cross, it is finished. Amen. 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 So, the first thing is that the story is now finished. Here's the second thing that's finished. It's the sacrifices. The sac you know, we all do stupid stuff, right? I do lots of stupid stuff. You do stupid stuff. And you know, we're not the generation that's exclusive. We don't hold the exclusive on stupid stuff. People have been doing stupid stuff for a long, long time. Every culture, every generation, people doing stupid stuff. Is there something awesome going on in the lobby right now that I don't know about? Because I see a lot of people going. Everything okay, Josh? Okay. Maybe we should go in there and have service. I might be missing something. <laughs> so the sacrifices ended. These sacrifices were, were, were blood sacrifices to appease God. They were, they were just there to keep you in God's good graces for a time. These were blood sacrifices. It's kind of gross. You might not like it. I don't like the idea of it either. I think it's kind of gross. And I wouldn't have, if it was me that was deciding this, I wouldn't have chosen that. But the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. And I wouldn't choose it. It's gross. It's unpleasant. It's rough. It's a terrible plan according to me. But you'll see how it all works out well. And so here, I want to explain to you how the, the sacrificial system worked. Just so you understand what's not happening anymore. I'm going to go to the book of Hebrews. I'm going to go to 10th ch chapter. I wish you'd go there with me. I want to hear those pages turn. Hebrews chapter 10, first four verses. I'm going to talk about the sacrifice thing. 
kind of a weird thing. I may be a little more familiar with it than most because I drew, grew up in a Jewish family. But the question I have for my mom, which she, she can't answer for me, is um, if you're supposed to be doing sacrifices, mom, why aren't you anymore? Huh? 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 No answer, no answer. We just don't do that anymore. Oh, really? Did God change his mind? Because I don't read anything about that in the, New Te in the Old Testament, about him giving up on those things. You're supposed to be doing a mom, sinner. <laughs> so it says the old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, right? It's like nothing, thin, not even there. Only a shadow of a dim preview. God's word just ripping this thing down like it's, like it's nothing. And people put so much weight in that system, right? The sacrificial system, the sacrificial system. We, we kill all these animals and present them at the altar. And, and, and God's just saying, like, this is nothing, dude. It's a shadow. It's a dim preview. You can hardly even see it of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year. Watch this. But they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. This is important right here, verse 2. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped. Amen. It would have stopped. But it's not stopping. Year after year, year after year, year after year, you see it right there. This is what's happening. The sacrifices would have stopped for the worshipers would have been purified once for all time and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. This is a side note, but listen, loved ones. Do you want to know if you're really, really saved? That right there. If you're still holding on to a lot of guilt from your past sin, you better check your salvation. Real salvation washes guilt from past failure. It doesn't just let you into glory someday. Hallelujah to that. We get to go to heaven. That's awesome. But listen, if you still have a bunch of guilt and shame that's still attached to you because of what you did before, I'm just saying, maybe you need to do a little bit of work with the Lord. Maybe you need to spend a little time with Him and just exercise 1 John 1, 9. Confess your sin. He is, he is, he is, what I, I've lost them. I lost faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. Thank you, Karen. And to cleanse us, cleanse, of all unrighteousness, all wickedness, some translations would say. So all that stuff that you did before, not only is it forgiven, but the feelings you have inside of yourself for doing them, gone. The world doesn't like that. They want to see, keep rehashing your, your mistakes and, oh, oh, that's Steve. No, no, no. Yeah, I know what he says he is now, but remember, yeah, you remember back in college when he when he there's stuff I wouldn't even tell you that I did. That let me tell you something, it didn't make the book. And it never will. I'm not happy about them, but I can tell you right now, and you might not like it if I say it, but I don't feel bad about them anymore. They were terrible. They are gone. They're gone. You gotta let it go. Real salvation cleanses us from guilt. And see, this stuff here, this wasn't happening. Year after year, year after year, year after year, they got to do this thing over and over and over and over and over again. But listen, not just year after year. Look at chapter 10, verse 11. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day. Year after year, day after day, day after day, over and over, kill, blood, sprinkle, kill, blood, sprinkle, pray, kill, blood, sprinkle, over and over and over again, offering the same sacrifices again and again. This is disheartening. Which can never take away sins. I mean, why would you go to work every day if you knew that you weren't going to get a paycheck? And this is what's happening in this old system. You, 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 you're never getting paid. Listen, don't come to work anymore. No, sir, I want to come. No, boss. I'm come. No, you're not. Don't come here anymore. It's not going to pay. I'm not going to pay you. This is what's going on here. Over and over again, year after year, day after day. But remember verse 2. If it was a real sacrifice that had any meaning to it, that could really cleanse, that could really help, if we could pull that one off, then the sacrifices would stop. Because then there's no more need for any more sacrifices, right? Okay, now, with that in mind, look at verse 12. But our high priest, can someone tell me who that is? Jesus, Jesus okay. But can you give me the liberty of, of changing high priest to Jesus? 
I know we're not supposed to change the word of God, but is that okay to do that? It's the same thing, right? Okay, so, but, but Jesus offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Verse 14. I'm just going to rattle off a few of them here to you. For by that one offering, Jesus forever, say forever, forever. made perfect those who are being made holy. So listen to that. You're in process of becoming more holy. You're in process right now of becoming more like God. But in God's sight and your position at the moment of yes, complete. Do you see that? So you're completely saved right there. But yet you're going to continue to be transformed into the image of Jesus. So the, the process continues, but the position, done. Does that make sense? Okay, verse 17. Then he, who's he? God, Jesus, yeah. I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. So he, he gives himself once for all time, for all people, for all sin, and he says, now listen, because of that, I'm not going to remember your sins or your lawless deeds. It's done. It's gone. What sin was that? Did, I, yeah, I don't even know what you're talking about, right? I don't know what you're talking about. So one thing I shared a couple weeks ago with everyone, everyone was like, wow, I didn't know that. You know that people say that God can do anything, right? Did anyone, anyone ever say, tell you that? God can do anything, right? Is that true? No. He can't remember a forgotten sin. He can't. He's unable to do that because he will never go against his word. He said, when I, when, when I went to the cross and paid for your sin and you said yes, I don't remember what you did back in college. I don't remember what you did at the, at the Deep Purple concert. I don't remember it. He can't remember that thing that he's already forgotten. He will not break his word. Verse 18. I've given myself. I'm not going to remember the sins anymore. And when sins have been forgiven, there's no need to offer any more sacrifices. The sacrifices can now stop. Never again must you bring something to the altar of God to ask for forgiveness if you've already done it. You do it once, one sacrifice for all sin, for all people, for all time, sacrifices are done. The altar is closed in that sense. But that's not what people are doing. People that are Christians are, are, are still, I hear it all the time. Where you been? I haven't seen you in church in two or three weeks. Well, I, you know, I really I went down the wrong, the wrong road, and I, you know, I just got to get better first before I can come to church. And I got to get cleaned up, and I got to purge these bad habits out of my life, and I got to get right with God before I can go to church. And, 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 I got, and I'm revisiting my, my old sin that I used to do and reblaming myself, and maybe if I give a little bit more online, then I can... Then maybe God will approve of me. See, religion teaches that. Religion teaches that we have to do all this stuff and then you'll be right with God. But relationship teaches that because you're right with God, you're going to do some stuff. It's just a flip. It's a flip. But you know, that's what the devil does, right? He takes these, the, the word of God and he just goes, just tweak, tweak. You want to do that? Go tweak, 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 tweak. That's what the devil does. You see, he uses, he's, the, he's, the, he's the grand poobah of religion, the devil. And, he, and he'll convince people that you've got to do some things right before you can be right with God. And God's like, no, get right with me. Like, just say yes to Jesus, and then I'll have you do some stuff instead of you trying to do stuff to get right with me. There's a big difference between religion and faith. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's masterpiece. Would the artist who painted the Mona Lisa come back and go, you know, I just need to fix that thing up a little bit? How about the Sistine Chapel? You think he's just going to get up there and maybe hang from the ceiling? And, you know, I just think that this, this thing needs a little tweaking. Right? What artist comes back to his masterpiece 
and says, you know what? This is just no good. I need to fix it. A masterpiece is done. It's hanging on the wall. It's, it's in the museum. It's under lock and key with laser beams. It's, it's not being changed. It's a mas- that's why it's a masterpiece. It's perfect, just the way it is. And God says, for we are God's masterpiece. Who's God's masterpiece? Is it, every, is it man? Is it man? Is it man and woman? Is it, is it creation? The creation of man and woman? Is it people? No. No. We are God's creation. He has created us anew in Christ. The ones who have been made anew in Christ, they're his masterpiece. The ones who are not in Christ, they're not his masterpiece, someone say yet. Yet, let's keep praying for them, let's get after it, right? But they're not his masterpiece yet. They're a work in progress, but if you're in Christ, you're a completed work. It's done. It's done. It's done. Yes, it's done. He's going to make you more like him. But in God's eyes, you are a completed work. You are his son. You are his daughter. You are, you are a co-heir with Christ, destined for glory. That's who you are. You're saved. You're saved. He has created you anew in Christ Jesus. It doesn't, my translation is not like the original manuscript, but it, it doesn't say do some good things so that you can be his masterpiece. It says we are God's masterpiece, a completed work. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You see the difference, right? This is the epitome of the gospel right here. And it's, it's the epitome of the vision of our church. We are... We're, we are gospel-centered. That's at the beginning of our mission statement. It says we are a gospel-centered church. Gospel-centered, which means we realize that salvation wasn't earned, sought after, deserved, or bought. It's an undeserved gift of God. And the appreciation for this gift should be stirred up all the time. And that, that excitement inside of us and the gratitude that we have for this gift that we got should drive us earnestly to pursue others to share that same gift with them for God's glory, their salvation, and our ultimate joy. That's what this is all about, this church. That's why we're here. So let me ask you something. If Jesus Christ, the perfect, sinless, spotless second person of the Trinity who spoke and there were planets, if he gives himself for your redemption, what do you have that could possibly trump that so that then, finally, God will say, oh, okay, now I'll let him in. Say nothing. Absolutely nothing. One sacrifice for all time, for all people, The sacrifices are finished. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let me read to you Hebrews 9, 12, just for good measure. With his own blood, this Jesus, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Forever. It is finished. And when God saw Jesus Christ on the cross, he says, I am content, I am satisfied, nothing more is needed, it is finished. Amen. All right, so here's the third thing. I hope that you'll jot it down. But remember um, last time I got up here and shared with you, I, share, I, I took you guys down a basement of darkness. And I appreciate, like not, most churches can't go there. And I understand that. But you guys are gracious and kind. And, and you let me just... Share what the Bible says, and you were good with it. And it wasn't a pleasant message. It talked about the the depravity of every single human being that's ever been born from the moment of conception, that we're all guilty before a holy and perfect God. Like nobody is good, nobody is saved, nobody is right. It's just crazy, right? It's it's bad. It's it's a dire situation. Colossians 1:21 was it was even worse. It was like the next step down the, the rung of the of the of the ladder down into the basement of despair where it says that you were once an enemy of God, separated from him because of your sin. 
like an enemy of God. Like a lot, and when I when I said that, when I quoted that verse a couple weeks ago, I like I'm up here and I'm watching. You're listening to me and you're watching me, but I'm watching you. And when I said that that you're an enemy of God, I could see people's faces. Some of us were like, eh, I don't know, preacher. And he loves God. Love, yes, he does. But I just challenge you to go into the Old Testament, some of those old books like First, Second Chronicles, and stuff like that where it actually said that God fought against them. Like the, the, he, the Jewish people went out for battle, like literally with swords and spears and, and shields, and they went out to actually fight the enemy. And it says in God's word that God actually fought against them and killed his own people. So don't think for a second that God's like this ethereal little being up in heaven, like the Sunday school Jesus with his little happy face, and he's just happy about everything. No. When you're disobedient, he's working against you. When you feel like you keep trying and keep trying and keep trying and keep trying and you get nowhere, guess what? God's fighting against you. He's, he, cause he, he, doesn't, he loves humility. When you, when you bow to him, he loves that. But when you rebel against him, he stands against the proud, right? That's, that's God. We're separated from him and an enemy of God. Like, that's dire. Anyway, you look at that verse, however you want to take it. It's a non-denominational church. You do what you want with it. I got my Bible. I got my own decisions. You got yours. But I'll tell you this, that it's a bad reality that we're separated from him. Um, and it's universal. It's every single person that's ever been born. Every single one. And I don't mean born. I mean unborn, too. I mean from the moment of conception, sinner. That's everyone. It's dire. L let me share with you briefly what, what this means, this separation that we have from God. I see it really laid out well for us with clarity so we can understand it in the Psalms. And Psalm, you, can, you don't have to go there if you don't want, but you can jot down the reference and look at it later. But it's Psalm 24. Verses 3 through 6. Listen to what it says. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? So like he, he, the, the author, David's saying, like, who can actually come before the Lord and worship him? Like, could you come to him and, and pray in the presence of the Almighty? Like, that's the question that he's asking here. Who's able, who's qualified of all the people on the earth, the good and the bad, the charitable and the wicked, whoever, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. David's like, I don't really know. Who is it that could come? And we would have that question as well. He goes on to say who could actually do it. Only, like, so there's just a small group. Only those whose hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols and never tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing and have a right relationship with God their Savior. Such people may seek you and worship you in your presence, O God of Jacob. So like, are you like me when you read that? Or when I read that to you? Do you feel like this guy here? Watch this. Of the contest. You're out? Yeah. yeah. Wow, that was fast. See, that's what chasing the Holy Spirit brings you to. Stuff like that. It's funny, but that's the way I feel. And I think that's the way everyone would feel. Like, I'm out. I, I can't possibly come before this God. I'm not good enough. And I'm like Kramer in that. That was a different subject matter altogether. We won't talk about that. I asked my wife about that one too. She said no. <laughs> but we feel like that, right? When you read these words of David, like who could come? It's like, I'm out. I can't, right? Nobody on earth could ever say, yeah, I can, I can stand before the Lord. I could stand. No, we cannot. So, so what? that's the separation. I can't go before the Lord. I can't be in his presence. I'm not good enough. So what God does is he gives us these priests, these go-betweeners, if you will. Read, uh, go back to Hebrews, if you don't mind. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 will tell us what these priests were like. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. 
When all these things were in place, the priests regularly entered the first room as they performed their religious duties. But only the high priest ever entered the most holy place, and only once a year. And he always offered blood for his own sins and for the sins of the people that the people had committed in ignorance. So that's what he would do. The people are sinners. He's a sinner. And so he has to present a, sacri a blood sacrifice first. All right, God, before I walk in there, now remember, it's only the high priest who could actually walk in. And he used to, what I understand, he used to tie a rope around him. And when he wouldn't go into the, into the room, if he didn't do everything just right, he would die. Like you can't stand in the presence of the Almighty and, and screw up. And so if you die, they wouldn't ever rush in there and go get him because then they'd die. So they'd pull him out. That's how holy God is. And they would go in there and they would do this thing over and over and over and over and over again for their own sin and for the sin of the people. He was the go-between between the, between the people and this holy God. The sinner, the broken, the separated, and God. There's a separation and he bridges the gap with these sin offerings. But look what it says. By these regulations, just the fact that these are happening, the Holy Spirit reveals to us that the entrance to the most holy place, this place behind the curtain where God was hanging out, that's holy and perfect, was not freely open as long as the tabernacle where this is happening and the system it represented were still in use. So they were doing this over and over and over again. But God says, because it's happening, we know that it's really not getting us anywhere. And some churches still are practicing this. This intercession of the priesthood. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I mean the confession booth. I mean, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. And I'm not going to rip on any denomination or ever any group. I would just say this, that I certainly understand why this is practiced, but it's an incorrect practice of the religious pursuit of righteousness. One, it doesn't work. And two, it's an affront to, what, to a perfect God because it, it sends a message to God that what you did and who you are is insufficient. That it's not enough somehow. And so I need someone. You said that, that I don't need this anymore, that it doesn't work, but yet you're still doing it. Well, because my grandmother did it, and my mom did it, and my dad did it, and they said we're supposed to do it. Let me tell you something. They don't decide your entrance into glory. They don't decide whether you're right or wrong with God. This thing does, and this book says you don't do it anymore. So sit under this authority, not under mama's. Grow up and do your own thing based on what God says. Right? So we're not supposed to do that thing anymore. So let me, let me just, as a follow-up to this, let me read uh, Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. 19 through 22. So, we don't need this anymore. He made his own sacrifice. He went in and he, and he did this for us. And so, Hebrews 10, 19 says, So, dear brothers and sisters, Christians, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving, say life-giving, life-giving life way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. The old sacrifices would provide cleansing to your outer body to make you ceremonially clean again so you could go into the temple at least, because culture would say no if you didn't, so it got you in. But it never worked internally. It never changed who you were. It never should change your standing with God and made you from wrong to right. It appeased them in the moment. But it didn't really solve the problem once and for all, over and over and over and over and over and over again. And Jesus like, because of my blood, it's done. It changed you from the inside out, inside and outside. You've been changed. God says you don't need a better priest than Jesus. He's the ultimate priest. He went in one time, done. 
And he says it's life-giving. Think about that. Like the curtain to the most whole. This is tough to understand because we're just sitting in this room made out of concrete and rug and stuff. But think about this. The curtain where God is, the one who spoke, it, it transcends this little stupid room that we're sitting in. The curtain where God is, is open. And you, little old Susan, right? Just Mike, Holly, Michelle, Kim, Charlie, whoever. He opens it up and he says, you can come in here and hang out with me. That's crazy, right? I'm not talking about an invitation to the White House. That would be cool. I'm not talking about front row seats to the Super Bowl. That would be cool. The curtain of the most holy place, of the one true star-breathing God, is open, and he says, come on in. That's crazy. The curtain is open, and access is available but not everyone is entering to enjoy this. See, some enter, but some of you, some of you are stuck in the outer courts. See, some of us are, are living by the truth of who you are as outlined in God's word, while others are living under the limitations of past experience or maybe a word that someone spoke over you that's not true. Or maybe you're living up, trying to live up to a cultural standard of false expectation. But Jesus said, it's finished. It's finished. It's finished. Come as you are right now. So it means that the Colossians separation of once you were separated from God and his enemy because of your sin, that's now gone. The separation is gone. That's the third thing. The separation is finished. And as a matter of fact, this is so unbelievably cool. In Luke chapter 23, when Jesus says it's finished and takes his last, last breath, you know, it's, it's talked about that the curtain, he made a new way through the curtain, right? He made a new way through the curtain because of what he did. And in Luke 23, this isn't just a story. It literally says that when he took his last breath and said it's finished, that the actual curtain in the temple tore by itself. Like it opened, it went and tore open by itself. Like it literally happened. That's awesome. A supernatural act by Jesus himself. The dead, how does he even pull that off? That was amazing, right? Awesome. <laughs> Hebrews 4, 16. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, there we will receive his mercy and we'll find grace to help us when we need it most. It's an open invitation to personal intimacy with God. We, the Bible says, are a holy nation of priests. So now I can personally, right here, I can be a supplemental blessing to you rather than a requirement. I can be a pastor, not a priest. You don't need a priest. You don't need a priest. You don't need me for any, you don't need any, any person up here. We're just a supplemental blessing. We're here just to love you and to, and to care for you and to teach you some stuff. Like, that's it. You don't need me. You're a priest. The curtain's open. Go in. Go in and enjoy all that he would have for you. The curtain's open. And so... Colossians 1.21, you were his enemy, separated from him, but now, verse 22, because of Christ's death on the cross, God himself, it says, brings you into his very presence. You don't even have, it doesn't say that now you can come in. It says because of Jesus' work on the cross, now he says, God brings you into his very presence, holy, blameless, and without a single fault. The separation is gone. It is finished. It is finished. All right, so here's the fourth thing. You want to know what else is finished? This is a big one. This is a big one. Sin's strength. Sin's strength 
Its control over your destiny is finished. We know from the scriptures that Adam's sin brought death to every single person. And, and because of his sin, it's now carried out into your body. It's in your blood. We're passive recipients. You didn't choose it. You wouldn't have wanted it. But this is what happens. Tough. You, we all get it. We're passive recipients of the sin nature of Adam and Eve. It's been passed down generation after generation. It's in our blood. There's nothing we can do about it. But, say but, Romans 6.6. 6. Romans 6.6. 6. Want to go there? Put your eyes on God's word. Don't just take my word on it. Romans 6, 6. These are powerful words. Let's move from rhetoric to reality, okay? We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. That might be your word for the night right there. You are no longer a slave to sin. That thing that you've been doing over and over and over and over again, chasing your tail, hoping it gets better, you can stop it right now, can't you? Mm -hmm. Justin, testify, man, right? You can stop, can't you? Right here, right now, you can stop. You still stop? Yeah, how long has it been since you had a cigarette? Six weeks. We taught about this kind of stuff, and he put it down. Boom! How long have you been smoking for, Justin? Ten years. Ten years. How many packs a day did you smoke? A pack a day. Every day. Done. Sin no longer has power over you. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ... We know we also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. Would you agree to that? Would you guys agree, show hands, that death no longer has power over Jesus? Do you agree with that? Yeah. You do, okay, awesome. Okay. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now he lives. He lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin. Whoa, do you remember? But do you believe that? See, that's the thing. We would all raise our hands and agree that, that death no longer has control over Jesus, but would you raise your hand also with true, authentic belief that sin no longer has, uh, or death has power over you? Like, we want that, right? I mean, everyone wants that, right? But do we believe it? Last time I preached, I told you that at some point, every Christian, if you're going to call yourself a Christian, you must decide, as a matter of your will, that God's word carries more weight than your feelings or your opinions. Always. And it says that because of Christ, that death and sin no longer have power over you. So I ask you now, do you believe it? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. You believe it, right? Just as, just as strong of a belief as that death and sin no longer control Jesus, you must believe the same because it's in the same book from the same mouth, from the same Holy Spirit, from the same God. There's no difference between the two. Jesus doesn't get more credit or... or no, it's, it, he said it, so it's true. It's true. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ. God's word does carry more weight than your opinion or your thought, always. And if you accept the gospel, then sin no longer has the power to send you into a godless eternity. If you accept the gospel, sin no longer can send you into a godless eternity. If you accept the fact that you are a broken man or a woman and that there's nothing that you can do on your own about this, and that if you believe that Jesus Christ is your only way out of that problem and embrace what he did on the cross for your sin and say, Jesus, you're on that cross, 
to take my place. That's my cross, Jesus, and you went on it for me. And if you say yes to that, sin and death, can, they, they don't exist for you anymore. They're done. Sin cannot send you into a godless eternity anymore. Do you understand? And that's all you got to do is say, if you just believe it, that's it. That's, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's the gospel. That's the good news. And I'm going to give you a chance at the end to say yes to that. If you choose to make Jesus your Lord and Savior, that would be awesome. And I, I pray for that every day for you guys, that God will send people for that. That's it. That's the only reason why we're here. Now, he can't send you into a godless eternity. God's broken that control that sin had over your destiny. But sin's powered in the present? Well, that's a whole different thing. That's a moment-by-moment -moment choice that you have to make. And you don't have to make it on your own anymore. You have someone who will help you in that decision Sin can't send you to hell anymore, but sin can be tempting, and you can still take the bait and fail day after day, moment by moment. But look at verse 12. It says, after sin no longer controls you and death no longer reigns in your life, you're not going to go to a godless eternity. But it also says, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. See, I don't understand that whole, that, that thing with God's sovereignty and he's going to make, like he, he, can, he can stop sin's control over your eternity. I get that. That's his decision. That's what he said. But in his sovereignty, he doesn't make us not sin anymore. I don't like that. I mean, you did the one thing. Why can't you just do the other? I don't know what the answer is. We can call it whatever we want. It's free will. Don't tell the Reformed guy that. <laughs> I'm just saying. I don't know. I mean, we could call it whatever we want, but I'm just saying. I don't know why God decided that. But he did. He did. So we have to make a choice of our will. But I will tell you this, loved ones. The, power, the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. Amen. That's awesome power, right? Deutimus, dynamite power. Dynamite power. And that power lives inside of you. And that's what allowed Justin to say, no, no more, no more. I'm not owned by anything anymore. I'm owned by Jesus. And this doesn't own me anymore. He has the power. How many times did you try to quit before that? A billion? It just doesn't work. We're not immune to sin's temptation. So if sin's power to send you to, to hell is finished because of Jesus on your cross, never forget that, then this fifth thing is true also. And some people reserve this fifth and last thing for Easter. And it's wrong. Slavery. Slavery ends. What do I mean by that? Let me explain to you what I mean by that. Same book, Hebrews. Great book. You should read it sometime. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Because God's children, that's us, are human beings made of flesh and blood, just in case you guys didn't know what human beings are. <laughs> made of flesh and blood. Because we're flesh and blood, the Son, Jesus, also became flesh and blood. For only as, a human, only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. So since... Sin's control over your destiny is finished. Our reality should change from temporal things to eternal things. 
We should be thinking about eternal things. We're no longer going to die. We're going to live forever. And so we shouldn't fear death. I'm not saying we should eat a Big Mac three times a day, every day, and just rush these things along and just say, well, my life is, is meaningless here. That's, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying that, that as, as human beings, flesh and blood, our natural instinct is to try to preserve this life at all costs. Because this is, you know, it's as good as it gets, and you only have one time to go around. You've all heard these things, right? You hear this all the time. So we want to invest everything we have into this life to make our life right here and now as good as it could possibly be. Sounds like America. Let me show you a picture. If you owned that house, if that was your house, and listen to some people, that would be an awesome house. Right? But listen, if you had that house, if that was your house right there, would you, would you spend every bit of your resource? I'm not talking about just money. I mean time and thought and effort and cash. Would you spend it all freely giving to, the, to fix this thing up like crazy all that you could because this is where you are if you also had this one available for free? So why are you doing it here? Why do we do that? Why are we investing so much into this temporal life when that is waiting for you for free. That's what we do. We're about to sing a song or three because he's worthy of that. Amen. You might not want to stick around. Man, this church takes forever. I don't care. <laughs> this is God. What could possibly be better than this? Nothing. We're going to sing some songs. There's a song we're about to sing. It's by Hillsong, and he says this. He says it, Oh, the curse of death has no hold on me. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Right? And when that thing comes on, when that line comes, I want you to belt that thing out like you've never, ever done before. Where is the sting of death for those who have accepted Christ? So here's your life-changing gold medal main event, your victory that changes everything. When Jesus Christ dies on the cross and he says, it is finished, it means his redemptive story is complete. It means God doesn't require anything else of you ever to be his. It means you can enter into his very presence without some priest or me. You don't need me. It means you can go to heaven forever. And it means death isn't a scary thing anymore. It means this isn't the end. It means this is just the beginning. That you're just passing through for a time and it's going to get better and better and better. And man, I don't know about you, but that's freedom. That is freedom. All at the cross of Jesus Christ. One sacrifice for all time, for all sin, for all people. It is finished. And if you'd like to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior and to receive that forgiveness... You can do that right now. And I'll pray with you, and you can just, that's how, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. You pray, you ask, you talk to them. But listen, beyond that, because I'm looking at a lot of people in this room that I know that I, that I believe are Christians, but I just outlined for you five things from the text of Scripture that, that tell us with clarity, I hope there was some clarity, as to what it is finished means. And if you have not lived up to those kinds of standards. Like you, you didn't understand that there was no sacrifices left, that you felt like you still needed to bring something to him, that you still needed to get better for, in order for him to like you or love you, right? Then that's not a full salvation. It's not there yet, right? You may be saved, but maybe you're not experiencing all that he would have. 
Maybe you're not enjoying that, that open curtain yet. Maybe you don't feel like you can go into his presence and just speak to the Almighty. That you need to somehow, like even right now, like come up here and you, you, you pray with me for your salvation. I have news for you. You don't need me. You can do it right there in your seat right now. You can close your eyes if you want to and just, and, I don't know, picture whatever God comes up in your mind. Whatever that God that, that he is. Whatever, maybe you see Jesus on the cross when you think of God. Maybe you think of a light. I don't know what you think, but just pray to him. He knows. He knows. what you, he, you don't have to have a perfect picture because nobody's ever seen God and lived. Right? So just pray. Maybe you haven't realized that opportunity that he's given you by opening up the curtain into the most holy place where you can go and come boldly to his. Maybe you've always felt like you were afraid. That you, even though you were forgiven, maybe you still were maybe not good enough to come before the Almighty and talk to him. That's gone. That needs to go away. Maybe you're still holding on to some guilt. Remember we talked about that a moment ago. Maybe you're still holding on to some guilt. Maybe the fullness of your salvation hasn't been received yet because you're still holding on to some guilt and maybe you just need to pray that thing away right now and enjoy that fullness of salvation that he would have for you. So we're going to put on some music and we're going to sing. And I think the vast majority of us are going to sing like with everything that we got. But listen, if you need to do some work with the Lord... Pray, talk to him, ask him to save you, ask him to forgive you, ask him to have a fullness of your salvation experience. All that was finished on the cross, I want that all. Say, I want that all. I want that all. So maybe you just need to do that for a few minutes while everyone else is screaming and yelling and having a great time. Jesus on the cross. Jesus on the cross, right? This is it. it doesn't, this is the Super Bowl right here of the Christian faith. It doesn't get any bigger. Put on some music for us, Danielle, please. Listen, you ready to sing? Loud and proud, let's get to our feet and sing to a king. Sing the way a king would deserve it. Let him hear in your voice your appreciation for what he did for you on the cross. Amen? Come on.